His name is Eugenio Pacelli, crowned Pope Pius XII. And this is his biography. I'm Mike Wallace, this is Biography. Our story, Pope Pius XII. He was elected to lead the Roman Catholic Church in 1939 on the eve of World War II. International tensions were at the breaking point and Adolf Hitler was vowing to destroy Christianity itself throughout Europe. The world took it as an encouraging omen that the man who now became Pope was named Pacelli, a derivation of the Latin word for peace. March 12, 1939. Eugenio Cardinal Pacelli is crowned Pope Pius XII. From now until the day of his death, 375 million Catholics will look to him for spiritual leadership. This unique role will demand extraordinary self-discipline and dedication, qualities the new pope possessed even in his earliest years. Born in 1876, Eugenio Pacelli is a quiet, intense child, the son of a prominent lawyer. Eugenio grows up in Rome, the seat of world Catholicism. Deeply religious, he haunts the ruins that tell the story of the ancient Christians. In his daydreams, Eugenio imagines himself a martyr, preferring to face death in Rome's Colosseum rather than deny his belief in Christ. Eugenio enters a Catholic seminary at the age of 18. The priesthood is the only life that interests him, but a severe illness interrupts his studies, and doctors tell him that he may never be strong enough to resume the rigorous training for priesthood. Pope Leo XIII receives a petition asking that Eugenio Pacelli be given the unprecedented privilege of living at home while continuing his studies. Leo, impressed by his teacher's glowing recommendations, grants the request. Ordained a priest in 1899, Eugenio's brilliant scholastic achievements bring him once again to the attention of the Pope. Leo XIII leads the church in a period when the Vatican is isolated from world affairs. He seeks out promising young priests like Eugenio Pacelli for training in the Vatican State Department. He hopes someday they will revive the tradition of Catholic diplomacy. Although he had never dreamed of becoming a diplomat, Eugenio Pacelli is soon absorbed in the study of international affairs. He works as a high-ranking confidential secretary under Pope Pius X. After the First World War, Pope Benedict appoints him papal representative in Germany. By 1929, Pacelli has won a reputation as a superb organizer and a subtle master of diplomatic strategy. Pope Pius XI selects him for the most important post in the entire Vatican administration. Eugenio Pacelli becomes Papal Secretary of State and is named a Cardinal. Almost immediately, he must face a crisis in Vatican affairs. Italy's fascist dictator Benito Mussolini, an avowed atheist, determines to erase the Vatican's influence over the Italian people.
Il Duce feels his fascist youth corps is seriously threatened by rival Catholic groups. He issues new edicts, which in effect outlaw Catholic youth organizations. To block protests, he slaps rigid censorship on all Vatican publications. Cardinal Pacelli realizes that Mussolini is testing Catholic strength. He reacts quickly. On his instructions, America's Monsignor Francis Spellman smuggles a papal encyclical out of Italy under the noses of Mussolini's secret police. In Paris, he makes public this outspoken condemnation of Mussolini's policies. Receiving a flood of protests from other nations, Il Duce is forced to abandon his campaign against the Vatican. He must content himself with periodic petty insults to the church, including a grandiose plan for building a giant mosque in Rome and importing thousands of Muslims from Africa to worship in it. During the 1930s, Cardinal Pacelli travels more widely than any previous papal secretary of state. He wields the authority of his office with calm, sometimes almost glacial self-assurance. As an administrator, he is demanding, methodical, a rigid perfectionist. On a tour of the United States in 1936, Cardinal Pacelli proves popular with Americans. They find that underneath his formal dignity, there is great personal warmth. <laughs> Cardinal Pacelli's closest associates insist that he is shy, that he is happiest when left alone to pray and to pursue his study of modern languages. Already fluent in Spanish, German, Italian, and French, he has mastered English in order to address American Catholics. There is a great need today of an education of the heart and of the will, as well as, as of the mind and of the intellect. When Cardinal Pacelli returns from his U.S. tour, he finds a mood of mounting anxiety gripping the Vatican. Pius XI has suffered a heart attack Doctors hold little hope that he will ever completely recover his strength. February 10th, 1939. The Pope is dead. Summoned by the Vatican, 62 cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church now converge on Rome to elect a new leader of the church. The cardinals are locked inside the famous Sistine Chapel. Here they will vote four times each day until a pope is chosen by a two-thirds majority vote. As the papal conclave begins, wild rumors sweep through the crowds gathered in St. Peter's Square. Europe's political crisis heightens the usual tense excitement of a papal election. Cardinal Pacelli, because he grew up in Rome, is the crowd's favorite candidate. But tradition is against his election. Very few papal secretaries of state have become pope. Early in the afternoon of March 2nd, white smoke pours from a chimney on the roof of the Sistine Chapel. Traditional sign that a pope has been elected. We have a Pope, Lord Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli. He will take the name of Pius. In the eyes of the church, Eugenio Pacelli is no more. At the age of 63, he is born again as Pope Pius XII. March 1939, 
Pius XII begins his reign as spiritual leader of the Catholic world and temporal head of Vatican City. Each morning, the windows of the papal apartment are flung open, announcing that the Pope has begun his day. Small groups wait in the square below, hoping to catch a glimpse of him. Inside the Vatican, a stream of bishops, archbishops, nuncios, and cardinals come to consult with the Pope on a bewildering variety of church and state affairs. Pius must render judgments on matters ranging from world politics to the design of a new Vatican postage stamp. Pius maintains an exact schedule, but for precisely one hour each day, he insists on being alone free to pray or meditate without interruption in the Vatican Gardens. Each evening, the Pope enjoys an hour of relaxation, often listening to music, Bach, and the operas of Verdi and Wagner. Pius seldom seems to feel constricted by the rigid limitations imposed upon a Pope. But when he first sees the small papal bedroom, he says quietly, it is no doubt very comfortable, but I know that I must die here. The summer of 1940, Mussolini plunges into World War II, dreaming of becoming a modern Caesar. Now all Europe is at war. The Vatican, although surrounded and dwarfed by Mussolini's police state, is sovereign and neutral territory. Its sole protection is its moral authority and its honor guards, recruited from the Catholic cantons of Switzerland. The Vatican now shoulders an enormous new task. Throughout the world, it serves as an international clearinghouse for inquiries about displaced persons, refugees, and prisoners of war. When the Nazis demand a ransom from the leaders of Rome's Jewish population in exchange for the safety of the Jewish community there, the situation is brought to the attention of Pope Pius. The Pope volunteers to pay the money, and in order to save Rome's Jews, he delivers to the Nazis more than 100 pounds of Vatican gold. Throughout the war, Axis soldiers are granted audiences with the Pope. Though he has condemned their leaders, he seldom reproaches the men. But one sorrowful comment expresses his feelings. Says Pius, my children are killing each other. Early in 1944, Allied armies begin a grim and painful advance into Italy. By June the 1st, they have reached the outskirts of Rome, the supreme prize of the Italian campaign. Pius fears a last-ditch battle for Rome, which could reduce the Eternal City to ruins. He issues an urgent appeal to both the Allies and the defending Nazi army. Whoever dares to raise his hand against Rome, he says, will be guilty of matricide in the eyes of the civilized world and in the eternal judgment of God. The Nazis evacuate Rome without a fight. For the first and only time, the course of the war has been altered by a papal appeal. June 4, 1944, Rome is liberated. Pius expresses his joy that the Eternal City is intact and free. But he feels there is no real reason for celebration. The fighting goes on. The only difference is that Allied, instead of Axis troops, now seek his blessing. You have had experience now of the dangers and uncertainties of life in the midst of a war. Make one thing certain. Let you keep always close to God. Let the Spirit of Sanctus come.
1945. The post-war era begins, and Pius realizes that his church must adapt to a world of atom bombs and automation. At an age when most men wish to leave things as they are, he becomes a cautious innovator. He helps to break down the wall of formality which has stood for ages between the Pope and his subjects. An audience with the Pope, once a rare mark of special favor, now is granted to thousands of every age, religion, and profession. For some, this is the most exalting experience of their lives. Pius feels it is of critical importance that he reach the general public in person, through radio and even television. He explains and updates the Catholic view on industry, movies, education. His writings are published first in the Vatican newspaper, the Osservatore Romano, later in every modern language. The Pope's statements are Catholicism's most powerful weapon in the battle of ideologies which erupts in the post-war era. Throughout war-torn Europe, communists carry on a savage propaganda campaign to undermine the church. Roman Catholicism, say red leaders, is outmoded, a dying remnant of feudal society. The Pope, they say, is obsessed with theology and is not interested in ordinary people or the modern world in which they live. Finally, in 1949, Pius issues a challenge to communist power. It is not possible, he declares, to be both a communist and a Catholic. The two doctrines cannot coexist. The edict is a severe blow to communism, especially in Europe. Pius can claim a victory for the church. is a holy year. Proclaimed every quarter century, this is a time of worship and pageantry when Catholic pilgrims converge on Rome from all around the world. Beginning the second decade of his reign, Pius is acknowledged one of the outstanding popes of modern times. He is noted not only for his temporal achievements, but for his spirituality, the indefinable quality that suggests his nearness to God. In 1955, the pope is the subject of a controversy in the European press. It is reported that during a recent illness, Pius has seen a vision of Christ standing by his bedside. The Vatican at first declines comment on the story, but eventually it is confirmed by the Pope himself. Throughout the remainder of his life, Pius will be deeply hurt by skeptical comment on his vision of Jesus. But most Catholics accept it and see it as evidence that Pius has found exceptional favor in the eyes of God. Greater crowds than ever before now flock to see Pius and receive his blessing. Despite his uncertain health, the 80-year-old Vicar of Christ continues his public audiences. And often he appears to enjoy these sometimes noisy interludes in his sedate daily routine. St. Lawrence of the City Cup, England. A group 
of the Catholic holiday guild of England. Holiday, Catholic holiday guild of England. St. Christopher, pilgrimage from London. Friends. Group of officers and the men of the United States Army, United States Navy, United States Air Force. Per vos et maniat semper amo. October first, nineteen fifty eight. At Castel Gandolfo, his summer palace, Pius is seriously ill. His doctor's reports are terse, unencouraging. Finally, on the morning of October 9th, Pope Pius XII is dead. for Pius XII are marked by splendor and reverence unusual even for the Vatican. For nine successive days, the ceremony has continued. The Pope's last will and testament is now opened and read. I am aware, he wrote, of the failures, of the sins committed during so long a pontificate and in so grave an epoch. Sufficient it is that my remains should be laid simply in a sacred place. The more obscure, the better. Pius is laid to rest in the crypts beneath St. Peter's Basilica. Around him lie nearly all of the 261 popes who have reigned since Christ said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I shall build my church. At his death, it was apparent throughout the Catholic world that Pius XII was considered worthy of sainthood. Traditionally, however, the Church does not give this honor to a pope until long after his death. Vatican scholars will study his accomplishments for several decades before delivering their final evaluation of Eugenio Pacelli, diplomat, scholar, priest, pope, and quite possibly a saint. Mike Wallace for Biography. <laughs>